announcements aside, we are going to keep going in our Solomon series, and we are going to change the tone this week. You guys know we've been talking about Solomon, right? And today, we're going to be talking about Solomon the real. Solomon the real. We've covered Solomon the ruler. We've covered Solomon the wise. And today, we're going to cover what I would call Solomon the real. And this is the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm curious, how many of you have heard Ecclesiastes preached about from up front? Okay, less than half of you. Yeah, most pastors won't touch this with a 10-foot pole. Um, And so I'm going to. Um, And I think, frankly, we have to if you're going to address Solomon and the wisdom that he gave us. But before we do, I want to acknowledge this is a tough one. This is a tough one. And I want you guys, especially today, to take a look at this background image that we're using. Because I think if we focus on this, this is where we can get the most out of this incredible book. If you'll notice up here, right on the left, we've got, looks like almost a desert, bleak sky, tree with no leaves on it. Looks pretty dire, pretty bleak, right? Then you go over here to the right, and you've got that tree full of leaves, sky blue, clouds, more rain coming, full ocean, tons of water, tons of life. And you look at both those things, it seems like they don't really fit. It's probably two pictures put into one, but I think this is life. I think this is what life looks like every single day, every week, every month, every year. There's this combination of both things. Some things are really tough. And some things are incredibly joyous and plentiful and bountiful. And I think there is where we meet Ecclesiastes. Think about it in terms of contrast. If you are artistic in any way, if you're a photographer, you know the value of contrast. There's beauty in seeing black and white against each other, right? And so I want you to think about Ecclesiastes in this way, or think about it this way. Nothing makes spring sweeter than winter. Nothing makes spring sweeter than winter. We're in January, pretty bleak month, right? And I, the first day of spring is such an incredible day. Went to college in a place that was pretty cold during the winter. And I remember that first day of spring, you'd go outside and you'd see people you hadn't seen in months, <laughs> right? People come crawling. We come crawling out of our holes and we're excited and we're joyous. And the reason we are is because we just had winter, but that's been built into the routine of our lives. That's okay. Or think about it this way. Nothing makes joy sweeter than sorrow. Nothing makes joy as heightened as it does the knowing we just went through something that wasn't joyous at all. Nothing makes mountaintops as glorious as those valleys. That's life. We have those incredibly bleak moments and those incredibly wonderful moments. And I think Ecclesiastes helps us to process all of it together. Now, let me put it for you in slightly different terms. I got a lot of questions for you guys today, all right? So, show of hands, and I really want to hear from you on this one. How many of you in this room are optimists? Okay, oh, wow. Hey, keep those hands up, keep those hands up, keep those hands up. Everyone, I want you to look around, and I want you to say, oh, that's why you're like that in the morning. <laughs> okay, good. That was, we have a lot of optimists in this group. Okay, how many of you would say that you are pessimists? It's okay, put your hands up. Yeah, okay, hands up. No, keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. Now I want you to look around and say, oh, that's why you're like that in meetings. Okay, exactly. Some of us are optimists, some of us are pessimists. Now, there's a group of you, and I'm one of them who didn't put your hands up. How many of you are realists? That too, right? Now you're rethinking your answer, huh? This is where we meet Ecclesiastes. Realists. Sometimes I'm incredibly optimistic. If things look positive, things look encouraging, the situation looks like there's a lot of hope in it, I'm super excited and optimistic. And then there's times there are situations that are not. And I might strike you as somewhat negative or pessimistic. We should be shooting for right down the middle of this one. Sometimes optimistic and sometimes pessimistic, just to be realistic. What is life giving us right now? And, and this is important, how is God going to help us get through it? realism. That's where we meet Ecclesiastes. Because here's the reality. With wisdom, right, we've been studying this for weeks now, with wisdom comes sadness. As we learn more about the state of the world, we say, yeah, the world is fallen. This is an easy sermon to give today, given current news, you guys. The world is fallen. We are not all on the same page. Things are rough. 
But with wisdom also comes hope. There is more than this. God is real. At times when the world struggles and looks for answers, the church does very well. When we are persecuted, the church does very well. Why? Because people say this place, this earth, isn't great all the time. And we're sitting here saying, duh. Right? That's why we're here. We're looking for something beyond that. And we get to keep both of those things in tension and balance. The sadness that we get from wisdom, the, we, the realization, the vision of the world, the perspective on the world, but yet the hope that there's something better than this. But here's the reality. The beginning of wisdom is that we've got to fear God. Right? So when we keep this tension in perspective, we have to remember that God only knows. He only knows why this stuff is happening. He only knows why this is stuff is happening now. And we have to sit under that. We have to be comfortable under that. Think about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God set us up, gave us everything we could want. to said, now don't take from that tree. But we did. And when we did, we got both of these things. Knowledge of good, it's happy, positive, right? And knowledge of evil. And that's tough. And Ecclesiastes meets us right there, trying to understand both of those things. And so I think Ecclesiastes is best read like this. On your knees, hands up. God, help. God, why? God, you know why. Just help me to be okay in the day-to-day, understanding, accepting that you know why. This is where we get to meet. Ecclesiastes. And I think this is important for us because this helps us as Christians to be a real witness in the world. We have a world that is full of doubters, okay? Doubt the world, doubt the political system, doubt their families, doubt God. We can meet them and say, hey, we doubt too the world, just not God. We can come alongside them and say, yes, you're right. It is awful. I'm sorry your families let you down. I'm sorry your schools let you down, your governments, whatever it is let you down. We're there too. And that's why we have put all our hope not here. All of our hope, all of our goal, all of our focus is on something greater than us. We get to come in and meet them in their doubt and in their uncertainty and say, yeah, I'm with you. Let me tell you about who I don't doubt. A God who created all of this and who wants everything to be better than this and wants everyone to be with him forever. And he proved it by what he did. We can be an incredible witness if we can process books like Ecclesiastes and meet people in a place of doubt. Martin Luther uh, had a great statement for how, we, uh, how and who um, really should value the book of Ecclesiastes. He wrote, Therefore this book should especially be read by new rulers who have their heads swollen with opinions and want to rule the world according to their own plans and require everything to toe the mark. But such people should first learn to know the world That is, to know that it's unjust, stubborn, disobedient, malicious, and in short, ungrateful. Once we really look at the condition of the world, I actually think it can be incredibly helpful in causing our eyes to look up at the Lord and know that He is in charge and to find our peace there and then process what to do on a day-to-day basis. We've got to stop looking for our hope here and look only for it in Him. Who wrote this book? So um, Solomon is usually attributed, right, as the author of Ecclesiastes. What we know for sure, we get a description here of Koheleth. And what Koheleth means in most of your uh, Bibles, that's translated teacher. Koheleth means a gatherer, a collector, a preacher, or a teacher. Okay? Most attribute this to Solomon because of the references to some of the things relating to kingship and what he did. Some say it's not Solomon at all because it was written many centuries after Solomon. I don't want to get into debates like that. I, to me, you attribute it to Solomon and you understand most importantly that whoever wrote it was a teacher, was a gatherer of two things, okay? A gatherer of wisdom and a gatherer of people. Ecclesiastes, if you guys have heard Ecclesia, you might, might sound a little bit familiar. That's the root word of community, okay? Gathering of people. That's what this book is supposed to do, to gather wisdom together and to gather us together and say, yeah, you know, this world really isn't all it's cracked up to be. But 
There's so much hope. There's so much more than what we have here and what we have now. And so the teacher, the gatherer, is the one who gave us this incredible book. And it starts out super positive, right? Ecclesiastes 1-2. Vanity of vanity, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. <laughs> you know what kind of day you've had. Um, absolutely, amen. Absolutely, amen. I want you to understand what vanity means, okay? This word here is hevel, hevel, and it means vapor or breath. It does not mean meaningless. This does not say all is meaningless. This actually isn't that negative. What it means is it's temporary. Vapor, breath, mist is actually another way to translate this word. You want to know a sermon illustration? Walk out that door, right? Tons of mist. It's been a very misty week. I didn't set that up. That was God. Thank you very much. This is a picture of our coast. That mist, it comes in and it goes out. And I actually think it's quite pretty. It's beautiful. Kind of obscures the view a little bit, but also makes things very pretty, but it's never lasting. That's how he starts this book. Whatever you're going through, whether it's good or bad, it's temporary. This too shall pass. That's how he starts this book. It also, by the way, Hevel is the root of the word, the name, Abel. Abel, and you're thinking, oh man, this just took a real negative turn. What was the deal with that guy? Didn't he only live to die? Right, we have Cain, we have Abel. Cain kills Abel. That didn't turn out so positive, so that's really not encouraging either. But wait a second. Abel actually taught us something very, very important. He wasn't killed until after he showed us how to give our best to God. And isn't that the whole point of life? That's exactly what Abel gets to teach us. His giving his best, his first fruits, is what made his brother so jealous. That's what caused him to be killed. He didn't do anything wrong, right? He actually did everything right. He actually gets to show us that, yes, in this life, with its ups and with its downs, the main point is what Abel did. You give God your first, you give God your best. Hevel, Abel, that's what this is all about. Think about it this way. This book is a great way to get you ready. I want to introduce you guys. Some of you might have heard this and some of you might have not. Um, you're not ready to live until you're ready to die. You guys heard this? You're not ready to live until you're ready to die? Yeah, I figured. So some of you have, some of you not. The idea is this, that you're not ready to live every single day until you know where you're going. What's happening after this life? What do you believe is going to happen when this stops. And until you know that, until you've processed that, you don't know how to handle every single day. Once you get perspective on what's happening at the end of life, whenever that happens, okay? And I'm not saying be excited about it or being happy about it. I'm just saying we have to know where we're going before we know where we are. I took a uh, really positive class called Death, Grief, Loss, Death, and Dying. Yeah, seriously. You know what the crazy part is? That classroom was full. Full. People fought to get into that classroom because of the professor and because of the topic. Routinely, I would watch people leave that class in tears, not because they were sad, but because they'd been released. Once you process what happens at the end of life, once you process how to be there for each other, when things end all of a sudden you have incredible perspective and peace on the day to day. Once you know where you're going, you know how to live every single day. And that's where we meet this book, Ecclesiastes. It's like life prep, right? It's far better to know what's coming, that there's going to be some hurdles than to have some false picture of what life is like on a day to day basis. Whenever I do baptisms, I always give people a little bit of a spiel. I walk them through baptism, make sure they know what they're about to do, direct them to scripture relating to baptism. And then once I know they're ready, I say, I need to give you a heads up. There's a possibility after you're baptized that you might be tested. You might be tried. You might be challenged. And if you have any questions about this, look at what happened once Jesus was baptized. Once Jesus was baptized, he was incredibly tested and challenged. And in my experience baptizing people, this happens more times than not. People are tested and challenged and tried because why? They just did a huge thing for God. 
right? We did a great thing on offense. When someone is baptized, this is something to celebrate. This is an awesome thing. But the devil plays defense. When God plays offense, the devil plays defense every time. And I tell people this, look, I'm telling you this not to depress you, but to prepare you. Because when it comes, when you're challenged, I want you to say, yep, I saw this coming. I know exactly what to do. I know exactly what scripture to turn to. I know I can call my pastor. I know I can call my family and friends and move forward confidently because I knew it was coming. That's why we have Ecclesiastes. When we have the hurdles in life, we have a book that says, yep, it happens. But we can keep our eyes above all of that. And so often in life, we try to figure out what the answer is, why this stuff happens, right? Why are we in this particular situation. Ecclesiastes 1.3 says this, what do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun? Another way of asking, what's the purpose of all of this? What's the end game of all this work that we do on a day-to-day basis? And unfortunately, I don't know about you guys, but elementary school, junior high, high school, I used to love the textbooks, right? If you, particularly with math, and you're trying to work on a problem, and you just get to a point where you're just really strained and you're at home and it's late at night and you've got to get it done for the next day and you're like, I just can't figure out the answer. But you'd be able to go to the back of that textbook and you'd be able to put the answer in. You'd be like, oh, that's what the answer is. Life doesn't come with one of these though, does it? I haven't found it. There, is, there are no answers in the back of life's textbook. What we need to do is stop trying to look for the answers all the time. It's an incredible quote. It's actually one of my wife's favorites. This is sitting on our fridge, and it speaks to this exact issue. And the quote is this. Be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves. Like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue, do not now seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. What if we could be more comfortable living lives where we don't have it all figured out, but we know the one who does, and we trust him? Just be okay living the question. And this is important Because there's an incredible and very real danger, folks, and it's the danger of dissatisfaction. The danger of dissatisfaction. Look at Ecclesiastes 1.8. All things are wearisome. More than one can express. The eye is not satisfied with seeing or the the ear filled with hearing. You can almost hear Solomon if it's Solomon. Just coming to a point like, oh my gosh, I can't get to a point where I'm satisfied and full and filled. And you guys have to understand that this is a huge pull for modern marketing. Some of you might have heard this. Some of you might have not. So I'm going to walk you through this. There is a huge shift in how marketers try to sell stuff to you guys. Okay? The job of a marketer, let me put it this way, is way harder now than it was 50 years ago. And there's one main reason. 50 years ago, we weren't spoiled. 50 years ago, we didn't have sheerly the number of variety of things that we do now. And I'm talking everything. Your food, your clothes, the number of cars, the style of homes, right? We have all this variety now. It's remarkable how blessed and how spoiled we are and all the things we can have. 50, 60 years ago, all a marketer had to do is find out about a new or innovative product and then show it to you. You automatically wanted it because it was different. It was new. Now... I mean, probably just think about the number of different phones in this room alone. Now, marketers have to do this. They need to make you unhappy with what you have. I'm serious about this. They've actually studied the psychological, the job of a modern marketer is to make you dissatisfied with what you have so you want what they just showed you. There's incredible danger in dissatisfaction, making us unhappy, and that's exactly what the world is trying to do, folks. The devil wants you unhappy, The devil wants you looking for the answers here. We need to say, nope, I'm not buying it. I'm content. I'm content with what God has given me. I'm content knowing that he is in charge and not say I'm going to be dissatisfied. Or think about it this way, no pain, no gain. 
Ecclesiastes 1.18, For in much wisdom is much vexation, and those who increase knowledge increase sorrow. This is what I was getting at before, right? With wisdom comes some pain because you're able to understand a little bit more what the world is, what your role in it is, but think about it this way. The more we know, the more we hurt. That might be true, but you've also probably heard that phrase, ignorance is bliss, right? It's just the opposite way of saying that, ignorance is bliss, but that's not real life. You know those people, right? The naive, those people who just don't know. You don't go to them for help, right? Ignorance might be bliss, but it's not real life. Real life is way more complicated than that. And we can learn these things to actually be stronger because of them. No pain, no gain. Think about if you've ever done anything like working out or pushing yourself beyond your capacity, you're going to be a little sore. But the next day, you're going to be stronger. Same with wisdom. Might be a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit tough, but the next day you're going to be a little stronger, better able to handle what the world throws at you. Interesting enough, there is a weird tie between this, this wisdom, this knowledge, and sorrow and anger. Martin Luther put it this way, anyone who's very wise has many reasons to become angry as one who daily sees many things that are wrong. The wiser we are, the more we're going to get a little frustrated because we say, okay, wait a minute, I know how God said it would be in the beginning, but I go out into this world and I don't see that all the time, and that should be a little bit frustrating. Now, I hope this speaks to anyone in this room who's a justice person, okay? If you're someone whose heart is attuned to justice, you are going to find that you're going to struggle with anger more than other people, okay? Spiritual gifts test, if you've taken one in the last five years, they will point this out. In my experience, right, we've got two dominant themes of the Bible. We've got justice and we've got love. Love and justice. And they don't belong like this. They belong like this. Inseparable, united, together. God is love. God is just all the time. However, us fallen humans, we tend to have a tough time doing both. So in my experience, people will fall on one of the other sides of that line. Some of you might be more loving and some of you might be more just. If you're a justice person, you're going to find that you have to deal with anger more than these people. Why? Makes sense if you think about it. You see a world that's right and wrong, black and white, and when things aren't like that, it's going to make you angry. So what you need and what I need is to have ways to handle that, to process that, to know what to do with our anger. And there is one and only one thing. You direct it up in cries out to the Lord. That's it. And I tell you this to help you guys, as hopefully as you've been thinking about this, this has been stirring things up in you, and I want you to know how to handle it. And also keep in mind, by the way, that the end of this is Song of Songs. We are going to end our discussion of wisdom talking about that love, okay? But we have to address this stuff as we head that direction. What I don't want you guys to be is wind chasers, okay? Wind chasers. Ecclesiastes 2, 4 through 11. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and delights of the flesh and many concubines. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired and I did not keep from them, I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. This is one of the reasons why we think this comes from Solomon. After all of his accomplishment, you can sense this frustration in him. I had everything, so why am I not happy? And if you follow this book along, you're going to find that the reason is because the only place to find that joy is in him. Him, to be clear, not Solomon. Okay? Joy in the Lord. Ecclesiastes 2, 24 to 25. There's nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? 
If there's someone who knew eating and drinking and having enjoyment, that was Solomon. And it didn't make him happy. What did make him happy was to have those things and acknowledge it came from God. This is why praying before you eat, for example, is particularly important. God, thank you for what I'm about to eat. As opposed to that thing that just automatically shows up in front of you, right? Keep him in view. That's the only place you're going to find that joy. There is nothing here on this earth that's going to make you happy apart from him. It's another way to put the exact same thing. And you can try it differently, right? We can work for other reasons. We can have our work started by envy. Ecclesiastes 4.4 4 puts it this way. Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work comes from one person's envy of another. This also is vanity and a chasing after the wind. Solomon, very wise, very successful, says, I've seen what happens when people work really hard because they want to do better than so-and-so because they want to have more. Bigger house, nicer car, better stuff, whatever that might be, because someone else has it. That will never, ever, ever make us happy. As he puts it, that's a vanity. That's a chasing after the wind. Instead, we're supposed to remember who's the boss. Okay? We actually get help here from Colossians. Colossians 3, 23, 24 helps us a ton with how to think about work and the work we do when we're here on earth. Whatever your task, put yourselves into it as done for the Lord and not for your masters. Since you know that from the Lord you'll receive the inheritance as your reward, you serve the Lord Christ. Which is really helpful when you have a bad boss, right? Or that person, maybe it's not just a, a, a boss at work, someone who's asking you to do something, you're like, whew, you frustrate me sometimes. But what if you're doing it for God instead of them? What if you literally say, God, you are Lord of all of my life, including the things I do, even when I don't think I need to do them. But I'm going to do it for you, God. I'm going to do it as a witness to who you are, your grace, your mercy, your sacrifice. You're the boss all the time. Your families, your friendships, and your work. Because life is seasonal. When you guys came in, and I think some of you were kind of sitting around before church, and you heard a different song playing before we started church. That's the turn, turn, turn song. You might have thought, well, this is weird. When do we become a hippie church? Okay, that wasn't why I put that on. That's a beautiful song. And if you're wondering where that song came from, I want you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8. For everything there's a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plan and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Life is seasonal. Okay, and we live this out, I think, implicitly because we're kind of forced to, right? We just forced that this is winter. And then spring comes and then summer and then we get fall. We have to remember, God had a choice when he designed this thing. He could have made it summer all the time. He really could have. But he said, no, I don't think that's good for you. I want you to have seasons. Now, we might think of that in the temperature outside, but I want you to think about it in terms of the temperature inside. In what season are you? In your personal life, in your emotional life, with your relationships, with your work situation. Which season are you in? For some of you might be thrilled out of your heads. It is the middle of summer and it is all good. And some of you are like, well, I was there, but things are starting to look a little rough. It's fall. Some of you are like, whew, it hasn't been lower than this. You might be in a time of winter. But remember, spring is coming. It's seasonal. All is heaven, right? It will pass. 
I actually think we can find more solid, balanced lives if we can remember that some times are rough and some times are not. This too shall pass. Know the season you're in and look forward to something else or know that something rougher might be coming, right, if you're in a wonderful time. And acknowledge that other people might be in a different season. You might be in summer, but someone else is not. And that means that might be a time for you to mourn with them, to hold them. Or those people who might be in a time of winter and you don't think anything's good, but someone's celebrating, maybe step into their celebration. Help them be excited because they're in the middle of a gorgeous summer. Life is seasonal. And Ecclesiastes and God's Word can help us get through each and every one of those seasons. Another thing this helps us understand is the nature of injustice that we see in the world. Like the seasonality of life, there's a seasonality to justice in the world. And the injustice that we see is temporary. Thank God. Ecclesiastes 3, 16 to 17. The author says, Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, wickedness was there, and in the place of righteousness, wickedness was there as well. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for he has appointed a time for every matter and for every work. Times we look around us and we see the mistreatment of ourselves, of other people, it's frustrating. That's just not right, God. And I can almost hear God say, I know. I know it's not. But I'm working on it. And I might use you to help me take care of it. These things that stir at our hearts, let it stir at your heart, but know that it's temporary. God's got this. God is coming back. That injustice is only temporary. And I think one of the things, this is, uh, we're going to wrap up today on this first half of Ecclesiastes, but one of the things we get here to help us understand it and to help us process these things is to listen before you work. Ecclesiastes 5.1 puts it this way. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than the sacrifice offered by fools, for they do not know how to keep from doing evil. When you draw near the house of God, and so one image of that, of course, is the church, when you come here in the mornings. But another way is when you just go before him in prayer. Do you go before him with your laundry list of stuff that you want to complain about? Or do you go before him on your knees, hands open, and you say, God, please help. Help me understand. Do you read his word and just read it? Not impose what you think on it. Read it. What did he say? Through how many different authors, human authors, right? What did God say to us? Listen before we go before him with all of those complaints. And one of the best tangible examples I can give you, Jesus Christ gave it to us. Luke 10, 38 to 42. Luke 10, 38 to 42. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village. And this he is, of course, Jesus Christ. As they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. You are worried and distracted by many things. There's need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Mary got it. She sat at Jesus' feet and listened. Doesn't need, God doesn't need us to work for him. He just wants us to stop, sit at his feet, And listen, but as you do that, as we prepare our hearts for communion, I want you to remember where those feet have been. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for giving us a book that's as real and honest about the state of everyday life as Ecclesiastes. We thank you, God, that you spoke into our world's which aren't always rosy, which aren't always great, and said, yeah, I've been there, and I have wisdom and insight for you even there. 
God, I pray for every single person in this room, those who are at the peak, full of joy, middle of summer, that this gives them perspective. I pray for those who are not at that mountain peak. They're in a rough valley. This is not what they signed up for. May they see you walking right with them in that valley. May this give them perspective. Really, God, what I want for all of us is your perspective. On this world, on each other, every single day. And I pray that we will give you full credibility and trust and love because you know. You could have sat on high and dictated the way the world was going to go and how we were going to process it, but you didn't do that. You came to us. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to live in this broken world and to do it perfectly. And then to willingly lay down his life because he wanted everybody back with you forever. That's how we do it, God. We give of ourselves to direct people towards you. As we take communion, may we remember that this bread, I hope and pray that we break it. Because it represents the body of your son broken for us. And I hope we take this cup of juice and we remember that it represents the blood of your son poured out for us and everyone outside of these doors. And we say thank you and we love you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.